157 years, our laws have said that if there is an adulterous relationship, the man is guilty, but the woman, despite having consensual sex, is a victim. The presumption was that a woman must have been lured into having an illicit relationship, that couldn't possibly doing it, she couldn't possibly doing it for her own pleasure or choice. That's why when the Supreme Court bench led by Chief Justice of India struck down this part of our law calling Section 497 that it was a violation of the fundamental right to life and liberty and saying that sexual autonomy must be respected, it was not just relief for men but also a bit of a feminist moment. They struck down the section and let me just read out what the section is so that you know exactly what is done away with today. It says that whoever has sexual intercourse with a person who is and whom he knows or has reason to believe to be the wife of another man without the consent or connivance of that man, such sexual intercourse not amounting to offence of rape is guilty of the offence of adultery and shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to five years or with fine or with both. In such case, the wife shall not be punishable as an avatar. So that's what that says. For years, this law had done reverse discrimination in treating women as helpless bystanders. So much so that even if a married man was having sex with an unmarried woman or a widow, it wasn't against the law because it was felt that he wasn't cuckolding another man. And the court law obviously didn't care for the feelings of that man's wife. Only when the man was having an adulterous relationship with another man's wife did the punishment kick in. Well, today, the court upheld equality of gender before the law when it struck down this section. The court also went beyond it, speaking about the status of women, upholding her choices, her autonomy. The court said that there cannot be husband's uh, monarchy over the wife, and that apart, there cannot be community exposition of masculine dominance. So these are some of the things that the court has said. Don't mistake it. It doesn't mean that if you commit adultery, there will be no consequences at all. It is still ground for divorce. All that today's judgment means is that consent is upheld and you won't be taken to jail for adultery. Why? Well, the court said in its order, if it is treated as a crime, there will be immense intrusion into the extreme privacy of the matrimonial sphere. And while reading out the judgment, the court pointed out various countries across the world which has decriminalized adultery. And it's not just the Western European countries as well. Japan, China, Brazil, Australia. Just like the 377 verdict, the court was bringing us up to date with modernity to be proud that our laws stand up for equality and while giving this judgment, Justice D.Y. Chandrachur overturned his own father's judgment from 1985, writing separate judgments which were also given by Justice uh, Nariman, Justice Indu Malhotra, and Chief Justice Deepak uh, Mishra with Justice A.M. Khanvilkar. So we're going to take you through various aspects of this judgment and talk about that we have really interesting guests first of all of course in studio we have the petitioner in this case Kalishwaram Raj he's the lawyer he's the one who brought in that petition which has brought about this change of decriminalizing adultery we also have divorce lawyer Mrinalini Deshmukh joining us from Mumbai and we have two writers who have never thought there was anything wrong with adulterous relationships they've made them heroes and heroines of their books we have Meghna Pant joining us from Mumbai and from Gurgaon, we are joined by Ravinder Singh as well. So I want to take up various uh, aspects of this. First of all, if we just look at the aspect of how it is, whether it is a feminist judgment or not. And to just talk about that, first of all, I just want to go across to Mrinalini Deshmukh. Uh, how many times, if you look at just section 497, how many people have been punished with it? Uh, so, uh, as far as the 497 was concerned, obviously it was a very archaic law and it also encompassed uh, the, the punishment that was meted out for the adulterer which was there. But if you go to see the reality which was there, 
the conviction in adultery cases was not really, really very high for various reasons. And the reason which I can uh, cite as a lawyer is that in cases like this, sometimes being a matrimonial offense, and I have myself dealt with this, quite a few of them, uh, parties do settle the matter. And once the matter gets settled, then these cases are not pursued. So I would say in my limited experience, it's not a very high number of conviction that really happened. Okay. Even in cases where there was adultery as defined by the then law of 1860 IPC, which is no longer thankfully today the law of the land. So I think this is what I believe could be one of the reasons that in a matrimonial matter, settlement comes up and then whatever are the number of cases that have been filed either under 498A, 497 adultery as we are talking about or other related sections, then they all get either quashed or they are settled or they are withdrawn and not pursued. So if there was so many convictions, uh, Mr. Raj, then why is it, what was your motivation for moving this? Why did we need this? In fact, it is much, much beyond marriage and morals. By way of the judgment, in fact, the Supreme Court has globalized our uh, jurisprudence, our constitutionalism, and even our humanism. You will find that f as regarding conviction and all, take the example, there is no mature family lawyering happening in a country like India. Very often it so happens that there is a claim for maintenance, there is some petty matrimonial disputes, and adding rigor to the kind of litigations going on, Often people are instigated uh, by either by the friends or by the family group that file a case. To, to file a case right. for adultery. Yeah. And it so happens that the moment you start prosecution for adultery, it's not a matter of conviction, ultimate conviction at all. When you start a prosecution for adultery, that precisely means very often end of matrimonial bond. Mm. It is other way around. It's the center has been arguing throughout that this is a provision which will safeguard matrimonial bond. Yeah. The effect, empirical data show otherwise. Yeah, that's, it, that, that, that's, quite, that's the opposite. Yeah, because that's what's interesting. If you read the judgment, it's a 250 odd page judgment. The judges say that, that this is between a man and wife and their consent and what they choose to do. There's no space for the courts to get in there with penal provisions. Now, I, I just want to go across uh, to first to Meghna Pant. Do you think of this, you know, that, that's about the penal provisions and punishment law. But for you, and you've just written your book, Feminist Rani, which has just come out, how do you see this? Is this, because, you know, I, I went through the courts that the court has given, and there's so many, there's so many uh, instances of it. We have so many instances of great poster moments, which are uh, comments where they say that, you know, the man is not the master, husband is no longer master, woman not husband's property, can't treat wife uh, as a chattel. So, Ravinder Singh, when you hear all of this, uh, you know, what do you make of the Supreme Court? I think it's a classic case of privacy, consent and sexual autonomy versus the collective prejudice just the way it happened in section 377 and i'm glad that the courts have struck it down it was archaic it should have gone long back but uh, it's better to get away of it today if not in the past while the well there's so much said about that how this was not a general neutral uh, case and how it was against women i think it was more against men than women because ultimately the the consequences uh, were born by the men. When you talk about the punishment, you cannot take a woman behind, you can't put a woman behind the bars as per this law, there were the men who were facing the consequences. So nevertheless, on various grounds of patriarchy and uh, as well as this case being against men, to struck it down is now a general neutral way. We could have make it, made it general neutral by still retaining it, but making it gender neutral by allowing it to prosecute women as well. But I think it's, better to get rid of this and then call it a gender neutral because there are enough reasons why state should not get into the bedrooms of people wherever there is consent uh, involved. Had it been a different case wherein one person is not in a consensual relationship, only then the courts have their full right to get into the bedroom and take somebody to face the law. 
Okay, and what's interesting actually, if we look at it, if we are seeing some kind of divided um, reactions that have come in. If we can just put up, uh, pull up on our screen the two kind of reactions that we saw from two women's body heads. So you have the National Commission of Women and then you have the Delhi Commission of Women. The National Commission of Women is headed by Rekha Sharma and she of course said that I welcome the judgment. It was an outdated law, should have gone a long ago. And then you have Swati Maliwal, who is the Delhi Commission of Women. She says, I totally disagree with Supreme Court verdict on adultery. Married couples will now have license for adulterous relationships. Where is the sanctity of marriage? What's interesting, of course, that it seems that on this issue, the courts perhaps expected uh, many people to question this, which is why you have uh, Justice Nariman saying it was never about Section 497, was never about the protecting the sanctity of marriage. In fact, it actually utterly destroyed by man having, it. Uh, in fact, it goes on to say that if you were to have a relationship with a woman or a widow, then you wouldn't be held guilty. Even if a married man had a relationship with a widow or with an unmarried woman, it didn't matter because she there was he wasn't offending another man and even if the husband's consent to such intercourse was there then there was no problem so what was being protected as the judges say was proprietary rights of men which is why they've stuck down so this entire bogey that it affects the, or impacts the sanctity of marriage seems to be one like that Meghna Pan, what do you make of this is is this do you think one of the most feminist judgments that we're seeing Absolutely. I can hear the hypocrisy dropping from millions of miles away. Finally, in India, I'm so proud of the Supreme Court. They passed out judgment after judgment over the last month and a half. That's making us feminists proud. That's making uh, the gay community proud. That's making women proud. The fact is that uh, this section was abhorrent for many reasons, both to men and to women. You know, you cannot keep putting women on a pedestal, first of all. First of all, they're not tradable commodities that can be refunded, exchanged with the permission of men. We have greater agency that, like, than that. We are living in the 21st century. So wake up, India. Let's stop denying the fact that women have desires, that they're exercising their sexual choices even without the confines of marriage or within it. Uh, secondly, we have to stop putting pedestals on uh, women on pedestals because that's also patriarchy, right? You're putting cultural tropes on women that they will be Devi or, you know, uh, Sati Savitri or Sita or Durga. No, we women are not that. We are also not your Chikni Chameli or your, you know, your, we're not all that. Just treat women with equality, treat them with respect, uh, give them the dignity that they, that they deserve. And I think this verdict is saying all of that and it's screaming it pretty loudly for everybody to hear.